Amen. Can we give God a hand clap praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's the one we're here for. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Man, God is truly amazing. Family, please take your seats. Please take your seats. Amen. Amen. God is amazing. And I am super excited for what God has for us today. Uh, let me start here. Good morning and God bless you, Shiloh family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm blessed and thankful to be here in the house of the Lord with you mighty men and women of God this morning. Uh, I pray you all came here hungry. I pray you came here hungry with your with your forks and your knives and your bibs ready, hallelujah, with the heart of expectancy, fully engaged and in tune to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to his church. I pray that the Lord allows me uh, to, to or uh, allows you to see what he's allowed me to see and enables me to articulate the word in a way that helps you to receive it and to apply it to your lives. Um, I don't plan to be before you long today, but we shall see. Hallelujah. Either way, I'm excited uh, to share this word with you. So please join me as I open up in prayer and we'll dig right in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful day. This is the day that you have made. We will surely rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Lord, you are amazing, Lord God. And we praise you with the praise that only you deserve, Lord. I just pray that you would help me decrease so that you can increase, Lord God. Uh, give us ears to hear, Lord. Uh, guard our hearts and our minds from corruption and error. Anything that's not of you, from you by you or for you we cancel it right now in the name of Jesus and we just release your spirit in this house Lord let your word have free course in our hearts and our minds and in our lives Lord God that you can be glorified Lord God that your body can be edified Lord we thank you for the work that you're doing right here at Shiloh Lord and, and how it's going to go forth and be a blessing uh, to the community to the city to the state to the nations, Lord God, we just declare that you will be glorified in this house and in these hearts, Lord God. We thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, family, this is the second week of August, and in our Shiloh Sermon Series this month, we're talking about the topic of abundant life. Hallelujah. Now, last week, Bishop set the tone uh, for this series in phenomenal fashion. Glory to God. I encourage you, if you haven't already, go to the Shiloh YouTube channel and check it out. Um, but I have the honor of following him up today, uh, you know, this week with this message that I have for you today. And my message is obedience is the key to abundance. Obedience is the key to abundance. Hallelujah. So let me start here. As we should all know, especially if you were here last week, John 10.10, 10, in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief does not come except for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So Jesus places himself in juxtaposition or contradistinction to the thief or the enemy or Satan saying that the thief is only here to steal or to take something from you, but Jesus came to give you something. Hallelujah. The thief wants to kill you, but Jesus wants to give you life and the fullness of life. Now his primary focus is eternity. He came to give you eternal life. But the Lord's prayer says, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven, hallelujah. Family, his focus is not only on eternity, he also wants us to experience the fullness of life in this life as well. Hallelujah. He wants us to experience a glimpse, a peace, a part, a portion of heaven right here and now. He wants our lives to be a representation and a demonstration of the beauty and the glory of his kingdom right here on earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Jesus also told us that the thief came to destroy, but Jesus came to do the opposite. Jesus came to redeem, to restore, to reconcile, to repair, to recover, to rebuild, to rehabilitate, to replenish, to reestablish everything that was lost in the fall of man. Hallelujah. See, in the garden, God gave them every good thing. James 1.17 tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Did you know that every gift is not a good gift? Have, have you ever received a not so good gift? Well, I tell you this, it didn't come from God. All right, you know what I'm saying? Man has a terrible habit of giving bad gifts. You know, but God never does. And what he gives you is for you. Hallelujah. God uh, does not, man, God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. That's his heart's desire is he is the blessing and he wants to be the blessing and he wants to make you a blessing so that you can be a blessing to the next person. Hallelujah. I hope you hear me in the garden. They were missing nothing good. They were lacking nothing good. They had all the good that they could possibly ever need and want and more with abundance, with no limitation. Hallelujah. You know, God said you could eat of every tree of the garden as much as you want, but don't touch this. Don't eat this one. Mm. Man. But Satan tricked Adam and Eve into believing that God was trying to keep something good from them. Yes. When the only thing he was trying to keep from them was evil and death and sickness and pain and sorrow and suffering and loss and all the terrible things that we loathe about this life today. That's exactly what God was trying to keep from them. But every good thing was theirs in abundance. Hallelujah. Yes. God never wanted these things for us. That's why he told them, don't eat the fruit of that tree. But if obedience is the key to abundance, disobedience is the key to losing everything. If obedience is the key to abundance, disobedience is the key to losing everything. That means whatever you think you have, if you rebel against God, whatever little you think you have, you're going to lose that too. It's an inevitable uh, reality. You can't escape it because the further you get away from God, the further you get away from the blessings of God, the further you get away from the provision of God, the protection of God, the covering of God, right? The further you are away from God, the more susceptible you are to the attack of the enemy, the more he can steal, the more he can kill, the more he can destroy. Why? Because you are outside of the covering and the will and the desire and the plan of God for your life. This is why Satan wants to draw you over here. He wants to get you away from God. If he can take your heart, if he can take your mind, if he can take your focus off of God, then you're going to drift away further than you ever realized. And you're going to turn around and realize, whoa, how did I get here? That's what Adam realized when he, when, when he heard the voice of God say, Adam, where are you? He looked around and said, things are not as they once were. Things are not as they should be. What's going on? And he tried to cover himself, but it wasn't enough. What he tried to cover himself with was, was not, oh, fell short of the glory of God. But God in his grace provided a covering from the mo for the moment and provided a covering for the bigger picture as well. He he knew that he was going to fall. He knew, oh, Jesus, help me. I was on TikTok and I came across these atheist uh, debates, right? And I've been going back and forth with these atheists because I'm really trying to hear their heart and find out what's going on. But they're so mad at God. They're so mad at God. They're, 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 their mind is so twisted up about what they believe and how could a good God allow these things to happen and da 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 And is it, is it his fault that all these things happen? First of all, no, it's not his fault. It's our fault. It's 
Adam and Eve's fault that these things happen because we chose to submit to a liar instead of the one who speaks the truth and nothing but the truth, the one that's for us and not against us. We chose to believe the enemy instead of him. It's our fault, but at the end of the day, whoever's in charge, fault comes to them too. And he took accountability by saying this, if it was my fault, I made provision to correct it, all right? Not only did I, did I make provision, but I came down in flesh myself and dealt with the consequences for your bad decision. So in the event that it is my fault, I take full responsibility and I will do what, you, what I need you to do to restore you in the back in the right relationship with me. All you gotta do is realize you messed up Humble yourself and acknowledge your need and receive the gift that I got for you. Jesus, help us. But in the same way, Satan is trying to trick us into believing that God is trying to take something from us. When he calls us away from those things, the enemy wants us to believe he's trying to take something from us. The reality is God is not trying to take something good from you, but rather the bad, the evil, the vanity that you gained when we listened to Satan the first time. That is the only thing that God is trying to remove from your life. He's trying to remove the bad things, the destructive things, the harmful things, the things that have been lording themselves over you and your family for so long. He's saying, I'm trying to take that from you, but why are you holding on to it so tightly? Why do you love the things that hate you? Why do you love the things that are killing you? Why do you love the things that are destroying you? Let me renew your mind. Let me give you a new spirit. Let me show you things that you wish you could see. Jesus, Jesus, the chains, the shackles that most don't even realize they, that they are in, that's the only thing God is trying to take away from you. The things that won't benefit you in the long run or in the bigger picture, that's the things that God is trying to take from you. The things that have destructive, even irreversible consequences down the line, those are the things that God is trying to take from you. God wants to take the authority away from Satan that you ignorantly gave to him when you chose to trust him instead of God. That's what God wants to take. But Jesus is trying to give you something. Jesus is trying to generously give you something. He came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. So what is abundance? Abundance means more, greater, plenty, much, ample, excess, not just a lot, but too much, more than you need. Why? So that you can give and give and give abundantly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we live in lack, when we live in scarcity, we give scarcely. We give scaredly. We're cautious with what we give. And, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about materialistic things. As a matter of fact, I'm about to get there in a minute. But when you have joy, you exude joy. When you have love, you exude love. When you have peace, it is a peaceful place to be around you, even if it's an ugly place around you. The peace that you carry can shift the atmosphere. I said a couple weeks ago, we've not been called to match the energy. We've been called to shift the atmosphere. We're not here to bring this, this dark cloud with us, but we're here to make the sun shine wherever we go. When we step on the scene, the darkness must flee. Hallelujah. But the presence of God will shine brighter and brighter the closer you are to him. Hallelujah. The objective is to get closer to God so that the manifestation of God will shine brighter in your lives. They should see that God is with you. They should see that God is on you. They should see that God is in you. Hallelujah. Me and my family were doing our devotional last night, 
and it was talking about the love of God. And this little, uh, this, these two siblings, they were out playing in the raspberry patches. And, and oh, Jesus, she said, Mom, we were in the raspberries again. She said, you didn't even have to tell me the evidence is on you. Yeah. You didn't even have to tell me. I could tell you were in the fruit. I could tell that you were in the fruit because the fruit is on you. You don't have to tell me. I see it. It's evident. Jesus, can they see that you've been in the fruit of the Spirit? Do you got it on your fingers? Do you got it on your mouth? Is it, where is it? Is it on you? Is it in you? The fruit of the Spirit will manifest and the world will see that you've been with Him and you've been eating of His fruit and not the fruit of the world, not the fruit of death, not the fruit of despair, not the fruit that the enemy wants you to eat of. As long as you're over here eating this processed garbage, you're not over here eating God's abundant life. Hallelujah. God made provision that don't come in a package unless that package is Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on now. Family, there is more to life than this world and what this world has to offer. There is more to life than this world and what this world has to offer. But the enemy wants to distract you with things of this world so that you cannot experience the fullness or the abundance of life and purpose. Mm. So the enemy wants you to think that this is all there is so that you might as well live it up, right? I don't want to miss out on getting high and getting drunk and fornicating and shooting and robbing and stealing and doing what I want to do and satisfying me and loving me. Why would I miss out on that? It's crazy. It's crazy the freedom that we think we have apart from God. We have a freedom to go back into chains, go back into bondage, go back into the things that are destroying us. Is that freedom? To that freedom why because our minds have not been renewed we have not seen the, the value of the glorious things as compared to these things because when you realize that these things are not lost mm, mm. Come on, Jesus. Come on. Jesus help us help me Lord Hallelujah. Bishop already told you that an abundance of things is no indication of God's favor. That's right. That's right. The devil can give you things. The devil can give you power. The devil can give you titles and positions as well. If we take a look at the encounter between Satan and Jesus in Luke chapter 4 verse 5 through 8, it says, and the devil took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this power I will give to you and the glory of them for this has been delivered to me to give to whoever I wish therefore if you will worship me all of this will be yours notice this Jesus never said you're a liar Jesus never said you're lying Jesus never said these things aren't yours to give why because they were his to give why because they were given to him by the ones that uh, uh, that God gave it to he was operating within the legal right to have dominion over an area that was technically not his but Jesus said in verse 8 and Jesus answered and said to him get thee behind me Satan Get behind me. You're in my way. I'm on my way to do something. I've got something to do. Get behind me. I got no time to talk to you anymore. I got no time to deal with you anymore. Get behind me so I can do what I'm here to do. Hallelujah. And he let them know it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So if anybody's going to bow down to anybody, it's you going to bow down to me. If anybody's going to serve anybody, it's you that's going to serve me. And so you have to be obedient to my command to get out of my way. 
because I have a God ordained call on my life. I have a call and an assignment that came directly from my father and there is nobody above him. So if you are in the way, you must move or you will be removed. Choose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 5 through 12. Watch this. It says perverse disputings of men with corrupt minds, destitute of the truth or with severe lack of the truth. They suppose that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself or get away from those people. Those that think that godliness or relationship with God is, is, is the way to just get gain and gain and gain and benefit for yourself and for the things of this world. He said, get away from them because there's a part of you that wants that. There's something in you. There is something on you. There's a flesh that you're still carrying around that that sounds good to, but that's not the spirit of God talking. As a matter of fact, in verse 6, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment is the state or quality of being contented or content. To be content is showing feeling or showing satisfaction with one's possessions or status or situation. Wherever you're at in life, Paul said, whether I'm a base or a bound, in any circumstance, I know how to be there with content because seasons pass. Seasons come and seasons go. Wherever you're at right now, whether you're in the mountaintop or in the valley, I promise you, you won't be there forever, especially if you apply this word to your life and start to obey the commands of God. It is inevitable but for you to experience flourishing and prosperity on a biblical level. If you would obey, you would abound. Jesus. But at what point is enough enough? Or will you always want more? Right. Will you ever be satisfied? The word says that the eyes of a man are never satisfied. That's right. That's right. And in the same way, the belly of hell is never satisfied. In the same way, a fire is never satisfied. A fire or hell never says, you know what, that's too enough. I've had, that's too much. I've had my fill. No, you can throw more and more and more in there and it'll consume it up. But God says at a certain point, you should reach your fill. Your needs should be met. You should be content. You should be satisfied. And when you have enough, go and share with somebody. Go and give to somebody. Go and bless somebody. Don't just store it up for yourself. Mm. Amen. Verse 7 says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. So having food and clothes, let us be with these content. But those that will or desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare or a trap into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. What does it mean to err? That means you've got off course. You are in error. You are no longer pursuing what you thought you were once pursuing, but now you are pursuing the gift instead of the giver. And the more you get away from the giver, the more perverted the gift gets because you don't realize what came from him and what didn't came from him. Jesus Mm. But when you start loving money and you start loving things, you stop loving God. The word says that those that love this world and the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in them. You can't love God and mammon. Mammon is not just money, but it's materialistic items. It's things that will perish with this world. 
Mm. The word says, seek not the things of this earth, but seek the things that are above in heaven where your father sits, where Christ sits with the father. Those are the things that you should pursue. Mm. He goes on in verse 11 and says this, but you, O man of God, you, O woman of God, flee the things of this world, but follow after this, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, Fight the good fight of faith. Yes. Lay hold on to eternal life. There's nothing worth pursuing but eternal life. There's nothing worth pursuing but Jesus himself. The word Paul, Paul said that, that I, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, I leave those things that are behind, behind me, and I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't want to catch anything but Jesus. Everything that passes me by on my mission to grab Jesus, to, to hug Jesus, to hold Jesus, it is worth the loss. To which you are also called and have professed a good profession before many. In other words, don't chase money. Don't chase things or power or position. Don't chase success. All of that is vanity. It comes and it goes. It's here and it's gone. But chase the Lord. Chase the things of the Lord. And everything that's for you will naturally fall into place. When you are pursuing God, the things of God will pursue you. Doors will open and he will bring to your attention the doors he's opening to you. Mm. John, 3 John chapter 1 verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's God's desire. That, that desire came from the Spirit of God to see you flourish, to see you prosper, to see you healthy, not just physically, but mentally, not just mentally, but spiritually, not just spiritually, but every area of your life. We, God wants us to be healthy. Yes. Even as your soul prospers, so it starts first in the soul. What is soul prosperity or the prosperity of the soul? Well, first your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Apart from God, you had a, a mind and a will and emotions that were contrary to the spirit of God. But Romans 12, 2 tells us, be not conformed to this world or the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or test or experience what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When you taste and see that the Lord is good, you realize what is not We've all spent a, a portion of our lives and the majority of us have spent the majority of our lives on the other side that we can now see the, the contrast of what life with God versus life apart from God looks like. And we see why God says you don't want those things over there. But there's a, 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 a mind shift. There's a renewing that has to happen because a part of you still wants the things that are against you because you're used to it. Man. Now, I wouldn't be what you would call a prosperity preacher, but you better believe I believe in biblical prosperity. There is a biblical prosperity and I've been charged to give you the full counsel of God. That's the, that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And as you know, I got no problem giving you the ugly. I got no problem giving you the bad. But believe me, I've been here to give you good news. Hallelujah. That's what I'm here for. The good news comes with bad news, but the good news is even better. And I can't help but to tell you about it. What if I told you God has more for you? 
God has more for you. Whatever little you've experienced of his goodness, he wants you to experience more of his goodness. Mm, mm, mm. See, the legalistic church thinks that the word prosperity is a curse word. And the licentious church thinks that the word repentance is a curse word. But in the middle, you have this thing that God has called you to. Hallelujah. He has called you to repent when you're out of line and out of order. And he's also called you to prosperity, to flourishing, to abundance, to blessing, to more and more abundant life. Hallelujah. Prosperity is not a curse word. It is actually the exact opposite. The curse came with poverty. The curse came with lack. The, per the curse came with loss. But biblical prosperity is saying that when you are walking in the counsel and the order and the favor and the, and the, and the love of God, you will experience yes. all that God has for you. And more, did you know that he could do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask for? Thank you. Did you know that he desires for you to overflow and experience the overflow in your life? Jesus, Jesus, family, prosperity is not a curse word, but there is people who have twisted the word prosperity to, to, to present it in an ungodly fashion. To have you seek things for yourself and not for God and not for others. The two greatest commandments, Jesus said, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah. On these two lay, lay the whole law and the, and the prophets. All of these things were pointing to the fulfillment of what God has for you. The Lord wants you to prosper. He wants you to flourish. He wants you to be successful in the mission for which he created you and sent you here to accomplish. You are here for a purpose. And you are here on assignment. The problem is that we have been uh, uh, trying to conjure up this purpose and conjure up this, this, this direction apart from God. The word says, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. Turn away from those things and draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Jesus. You know, the closer you are to the presence of God, the more you will experience the character of God, yeah. the attributes of God, right. who he is. The closer you get to the sun, the hotter it gets. It's that same thing. But the S-O-N is so much brighter and so much better than the S-U-N. Hallelujah. And in the presence of God, even the worst parts of this life and everything that it has to throw at you is better with Jesus. Whatever you may have to go through in this life, you will have tribulation. In this life, you will uh, uh, deal with sickness and loss and betrayal and heartbreak and heartache and law and, and all the things that come with this life. It is unavoidable. It is unescapable. You will experience these things because everybody is not walking with God. So everybody that gets close to you is not bringing God with them. But you are to bring God to them. Be careful not to run from people who don't have God. Those are supposed to be the people you run to. The people you go to. The, Jesus sat with sinners. Why? Not so that he could uh, uh, do what they do, but so that he could present to them what he has. Jesus. So turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 11. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to read and break this down. This jumped 
out to me when me and my family were reading the other day, uh, Joshua chapter 11. And as you guys are turning there, uh, starting in verse one, I'm gonna kind of set the tone. So in the chapters leading up to this, Joshua and the children of Israel are now in the promised land. And they've been there for a little while now, taking territory little by little. And at this point of their conquest, five kings have conspired to form an alliance to wage war against Israel. After hearing how the great city of Ai was overthrown by God, hallelujah. Needless to say, these five kings failed miserably in their mission and they got utterly destroyed as well. The Lord not only knocked off a great multitude of their army with hailstones, as a matter of fact, it says that the Lord wiped out uh, more with hailstones than they did with their swords. And I was just imagining, like, you know, the word says if God is for us, who could be against us, right? You could have a, 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 a army in front of you, and if you're by yourself, God is with you. And I just saw them, they're going to battle, and they're swinging their sword, but God's like, bing, 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 plucking people, knocking people off, you know what I'm saying, with these hailstones. And, and they're just, they're swinging their sword, and they're hitting one, but 20 are falling. And it's like, whoa, what's going on? This is crazy. This is important you got to swing your sword right but God can maximize the effects of your obedience of your willingness to get to work whatever you could do he can amplify and maximize what you do hallelujah <laughs> Jesus Jesus I, man kingdom math is amazing Kingdom math is amazing and New Testament math is multiplication we will see God, multiply your efforts. God also made the sun and the moon stand still until this wave of Israel's enemies were conquered. So it caused a stir and a panic in the surrounding territories. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. So Joshua chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass... When Jabin, uh, king of Hazor, heard these things that he sent to J uh, Jobab, king of Ma uh, Madan, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of uh, Akshaph, and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains, and the, the plains of the south of Chinneroth, and in the valley, and in the borders on the west, and then uh, to the Canaanites that are on the east and on the west, and to the Amorite, and to the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Jebusite, in the mountains, and to the Hivite under Hermon, in the land of Mizpeh. So they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude with very many horses and chariots. And when all these kings met together, they, they came and camped together at the waters of Mer uh, Merom to fight against Israel. Okay, so think about this. You're coming with a power and a presence that is shaking the nations around you so much that your enemies are conspiring to come together saying that if we don't work together, these people will surely overtake what we think is ours right now. Jesus, because greater is he that is in them and that is with them than those that are in the world. They're panicking right now because where they just came from, where Israel, the, the Israelites just conquered, that was a big city with a powerful reputation and if they came in there and wiped them out and then they came in there and they wiped out these five kings and all their armies and they're coming this way what you think's about to happen to us so they're like man gather it all together and these kings had met together and they came and they camped together uh, at the waters of Maram to fight against Israel. But the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time I will deliver them up all slain before Israel. 
and you shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. And Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Aram, and they attacked them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who defeated them and chased them to Great Sidon and to the brook uh, Misrephoth. Misra and to the valley of Mizpah, of Mizpah, eastward. And they attacked them until they left nothing or none remaining. And Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him and hamstring their, their horses and burned their chariots with fire. And Joshua turned back at that time and took uh, Hazor uh, and struck or smote the king thereof with the sword and Hazor for Hazor was formerly the head of all those kingdoms let me pause there when you take the head off you can have your way with the body when you take the head off you can establish a new king you can establish a new order, a new structure, a new kingdom. Hallelujah. You, and so he's coming and he, they wiped out everything. Not only the, 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 the lower part, but the head as well. And they struck all the souls that were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. And there was none left breathing. Then... He burned Hazor with fire. So all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them, Joshua took and struck them with the edge of the sword and he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. But as for the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them except Hazor only, which Joshua burned. And all the spoil of these cities and the livestock and the children of, uh, the children of Israel took for a bounty to themselves and they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them and they left none breathing let me let you know this the word says we wrestle not against flesh and blood all right these things though they actually happen they're illustrations or or allegories for us to understand the spiritual warfare that we're at there's territories and regions there's places in your life that god has called you to subdue and have dominion and these spirits that have been operating and reigning over you and your family for so long we are going to chop their heads off we are going to take them out we are going to cut them down we are going to overcome them and they will be utterly destroyed out of our lives Jesus but verse 15 says this as the Lord commanded Moses his servant so Moses commanded Joshua and so Joshua did and he left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses this is important, family. Again, we see obedience is the key to abundance. And when you come under authority, you become the authority. That means what Bishop says goes as long as it's in line with what God said. And if you rebel against Bishop, you rebel against God because God's not telling you or Bishop's not telling you what he wants you to do. He's telling you what God has told him to do. And he's leading by example, doing it for you. And if you were to follow the instructions of the leader that God has established over you or in your life, you will flourish even in greater measure. You will experience potentially a double portion yes. of what God is doing through your leader. Yes. Watch what happened when Joshua submitted to God in the same way that Moses did. Verse 16 says, and Joshua took all this land. The mountain country or the hills, the south and the land of Goshen, the lowland or the valley and the Jordan plain and the mountains of Israel and the valley of the same and the Mount Hal uh, Halak and the ascent to Seir, uh, even to Baal uh, Gad in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings. 
and struck them down and killed them. Joshua made war with these kings a long time. This didn't happen overnight, family. But the persistence and the consistency of his obedience, it's not a matter of I obeyed one time, but I'm not obeying anymore. I did it one time, but I'm not doing it anymore. That means when you stopped obeying, you stopped abounding. When you stopped doing what he said to do, the blessing stopped flowing the way that he wanted them to flow. But Joshua continued to make war with these kings until he subdued, destroyed, and took dominion. Nice. There's some things that you've been fighting. There's some things that you've been battling. Some things that you've been trying to overcome, family. Don't quit fighting. Fight the good fight of faith. Continue to war against these, these stubborn spirits, these stubborn things that are trying to stay in your life. They have to go. They have to go. They don't, they don't have jurisdiction when the children of God are in place. They may resist you because they are trying to see if you really believe God. If you're going to stand in authority and say, I'm not negotiating. My father said this is mine and I'm standing until I receive the fullness of it. Yes. Bishop says, I won't give up, let up, back up or shut up. I'm here to stay. One of us is going to move and it ain't me. Somebody better get up out of here if it's not of God. That's all I know. Because it's going to be real uncomfortable for you. I need my elbow room. <laughs> Amen. See, once you've entered into Christ, you have entered into the promised land. But now you have to subdue and have dominion over everything that is entrusted to you, starting with you. Yeah. Starting with your mind, starting with your thoughts, starting with your mouth, starting with the things that you speak and the things that you do and the places that you go and the things that you submit to and the things that you agree with, the things that you partner with, the things that you compromise and allow in, 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 in the move that you're doing. It starts with you, but it also moves on to those things that were entrusted to you. See, these kings in this passage, they represent spirits, yeah. principalities, and powers of wickedness in high places, things that have exalted themselves over you and your marriage and your families and your communities. And those spirits have occupied the land for so long, for a long time, uh, but it was never theirs to begin with. It was never theirs to begin with. They usurped the authority to occupy these places. But now that the rightful owner, the rightful owners are in place, they got to go. I know you feel like or you think that this is yours, but it's not because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I am a co-heir with Christ. That means everything that belongs to him belongs to me. That means if it's not of the kingdom of light, it has to go. Jesus. 19 says this, there was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All others they took in battle. There's something important about the word Hivites. The word Hivites means villagers, right? There was a people that saw God move and they came and even in a sneaky way, they came and they, they, they made an alliance with Israel. They tricked Israel into making a covenant with them to protect them and to, to keep them. And they were made the servants of Israel for the foreseeable future. You know what I'm saying? They were there to serve Israel, but they saw something. They saw that the God you serve 
is mighty and powerful. And we've heard the testimonies of, of, of what he does and what he could do. And what I do know is I don't want to be on the opposite side of the battlefield from him. So, so let me come over there with you. Maybe I'm not fully surrendered. Maybe I'm not fully invested. Maybe I don't fully understand. But I do know this. I need to be among those people. I need to be with those people. So... The word tells us, Jesus, thank you, Lord, yes. that the reapers will come and they will separate the wheat and the tear. Let them grow up and in due season you will see what's real and what's fake. Don't pluck them out if they seem to be fake, but let your light shine. Let, be, let them be among you because what if in your presence they, they get the answers to the things that they didn't yet know? Don't run them off. Don't rush them off because they're not perfect or they're not fully surrendered. They know enough that they know they need to be here. And this is a lot closer to God than, than out there. So let them in. Draw them in. As a matter of fact, spend some time with them. Love them. Show them what the heart and the, the mind of God actually is. Let them know that God's objective is not to destroy you, but to give you life and to give it more abundantly. He doesn't want you to fear him. He wants you to love him. And he wants you to love him once you realize how much he loves you. The word says we love him because he loved us first. But the other cities that refused to make peace with the children of Israel. Verse 20 says, it was the Lord that hardened their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, that they might receive no mercy, uh, but they might, that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. And at that time, jo uh, came Joshua and cut off the Anakim from the mountain. Now the Anakim, these were giants. These were giants that ruled the land for such a long period of time that people were afraid of these giants because they seemed insurmountable. They seemed uh, un undefeatable. But Joshua had cut them off too. From Hebron, from the beard, to an from Anab, uh, and from the mountains of Judah, and from the mountains of Israel, Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. None, none, none of the Anakim were left in the, uh, in the land of the children of Israel. They only remained in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod. These were cities outside of the promised land. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said to Moses and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions and the land rested from war. Hallelujah. You guys are the forerunners. You guys are the trailblazers. You guys are the ones that God has called to subdue and have dominion, to conquer, not only for yourselves, but the ones after you will benefit from your success in the Lord, from your achievement to all that he's called you to now. The, ne the next chapter tells us that Joshua subdued and took dominion over 31 kings to Moses' two. Moses overtook two kings. Joshua overtook 31. In other words, Moses' floor was Joshua's ceiling. You're setting your successor up to achieve and accomplish even more than you. Jesus said, greater works you will do even than me. That's beautiful. Jesus set you up, set us up to flourish and to prosper in our assignment in a multiplied fashion. But I was looking at 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 7 through 9, at the heart of Saul. 
It says, and the women answered one another as they played and they said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth and displeased at him, uh, uh, at him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and they have ascribed to me thousands. But what can he have more than the kingdom itself? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. David's success manifested a spirit of envy in the heart of Saul that produced a spirit of murder in him as well. Yes. That is not the heart of God. That's right. That is not the spirit of God. A man of God does not care to outshine anybody. That's right. The word says, let your light shine that they may see your good works and glorify who? Your father. your father in heaven. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. It is he that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's not for our glory, but it's for his glory. And the fact of the matter is, I want to see you shine That's right. to the full brightness of what you can be. Even if you outshine me, I'm not mad because I still get to serve the king. I still get to be, I, even if I get to be a doorman, it's all right with me. I get to serve the king. And if God uh, is able to use my shoulders to carry you higher, praise God. That's my position. That's my purpose. That's what I'm here for. I'm not mad at you shining as long as God gets the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very good. Let me end with this. God wants you to win. He wants you to win so that your children can win, so that your family can win, so that the ones with you can win, so that the ones around you can win, so that the ones following after you can win in even greater fashion than you did. Obedience is the key to abundance. God has more for you and God is calling you to obey, not because you have to, but because you get to. The things he's called you to is a blessing, it's an honor, it's a privilege, it's an opportunity. Do not look at it as a burden. You get to do these things. I say this all the time, I sing this song to Callie all the time, I say I get to be your daddy. I get to be your daddy. I say that to my kids. I say that to my wife. I get to be your husband. I get to be your pastor. I get to serve the Lord. I get to be his son. I don't have to do these things. I get to do these things. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And from that position, I see the blessing that all of it is. But I tell you the same thing I told them the other day. You better enjoy it while it lasts because it's not around forever. And when it passes, you're gonna wish you could go back to that place. So while you have it, and while you're in it, do it for the glory of God. Man, man, God is truly amazing. I want you guys to know that the Lord wants you to flourish, He wants you to prosper, but the key to abundance is obedience. Can we give God a hand for our prayers? Hallelujah. 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 Anybody, if anybody is in need of prayer, I'm, I'm more than excited to pray for you. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I would love to introduce him to you, introduce you to him. Uh, and so come on up, come on up. The altar is open, family. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Stephen Worley. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to ShilohHub.com. Remember to hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.